We're at the National Book Festival run by the Library of Congress here in Washington, D.C. I'm sitting right now with Ken Burns, documentarian, filmmaker, author uh, of a book called Grover Cleveland, again, A Treasury of American Presidents. It's a beautiful picture book that I'm holding in my hands. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we, we need to start with the title, Grover Cleveland, again. There's a lot of presidents. This yep. is a Treasury of American Presidents. Grover Cleveland wins the title. Tell us how that all happened. So I've got four daughters ranging from 35 to five, and they all have at one point, usually around when they were five, memorized the presidents with me lying there drilling Surprise. them on it. Yeah. And so when you get through, uh, in the, about the middle of it, you go Grover, they say Cleveland, you go Benjamin, they go Harrison, and then you say Grover and they go Cleveland again because he's the only president that had two non-consecutive terms. And it's sort of a milestone, the only one of all the presidents that had an interrupted uh, time in the White House. And so it's a great starting point to begin to interest people. And so I vowed after my oldest daughter, I said, well, let's make a book, a children's book. And then years go by and my next daughter and years, many, many years go by and my third daughter and finally said, I better do something in time this year for my youngest, uh, Willa, who has learned them all and recited them. And so what we did is try to humanize them. These are people that we put up on pester pedestals or we denigrate, but they're all human beings. They all had parents. They all, most of them had siblings. They had pets. They were somebody and it's an, a chance to give you a sense of how the presidency goes, but also to introduce you to stuff that you could use in book reports in, you know, anywhere from third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade. It's enough density of material that, um, you know, it brings up complicated stuff like uh, slavery, like money issues, like uh, scandal, but it's not trying to make anybody wrong. It's just, it's just uh, communicating the humanness. You know, the guy who had a alligator in his thing, the guy who was five foot one, James Madison, and the lightest president, the tallest president, Lincoln, you know, the fattest president, you know, the disabled. You know, we had a president who served the longer than anyone else who was in a wheelchair, who couldn't stand unaided. You know, another president, Woodrow Wilson, was dyslexic, we believe. You know, so there's interesting things as in our modern time, these people reflect all the varieties of who we are, too. Yeah, and we should mention your illustrator, uh, Gerald Kelly, these, you know, beautiful, amazing It's wonderful, and there's the White House being burned by the British during the War of 1812. James Madison is barely escaping. His wife is saving some of the precious documents. It's it's stunning. The, the, the artwork is really is really amazing. But what, what I think about as I read this book, for, as someone who's followed your work for a long time, is that these are facts that you just know, that you just walk around with like this, this treasure trove in your head all the time and figuring out how to take some of that. Some of these presidents maybe you didn't know as much about, but taking that and put it into a, in a way that a child or a younger reader can really gravitate to that's, and understand. That's really a hard thing to do. And I, I don't think I fully appreciated when we began the project how, just how complicated it would be to try to communicate the humanness at a certain level. Because we are filled with all this stuff. Those of us who mine American history, we do know maybe too many things. And I live in New Hampshire and we make maple syrup there. And it takes 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of maple syrup. So that's sort of what this is and how to distill it and what to leave in and, and how much of the darker stuff do you put in. I mean, you don't want to do too much. We've left sex scandals out of it. It just seemed inappropriate for that age group. But we talk about other scandals and, and issues of race and slavery that have proceeded through most of our American history or monetary issues that sound sort of dry. But I, th I think they come off sounding like it's very familiar, like what was going on in the early days of the Republic or kind of what's going on now. It yeah. just different styles of dress, different kinds of uh, people, but the issues are the same. The American issues are the same. What are you finding when you talk to young people and in terms of interest in history? I mean, you, you, you've been part of some of the biggest history moments on television, the, the Civil War, and then obviously the baseball and jazz and all the wonderful things that you've created. The Civil War, we were talking earlier, what a transformative moment yes. on television. What do you think in terms of the way kids gravitate to history now? Is it having the same effect that it did when you were younger? Well, you know, I'm in a bit of a gigantic bubble in that I meet a lot of people in the course of my work kids included that are, are already turned on to history and in large measure because they said they say that they saw my films and were inspired and that's wonderful but we also know that history is is sort of 
leeching out of our educational mandate. And, and we're, we've, we don't even teach history, we teach social studies, we're uninterested in civics, how things work. And so I, I just feel that we have to remind people that the word history is mostly made up of the word story plus Hi, and that, that, that's what it's about. The, uh, Harry Truman said the only thing that's really new is the history you don't know. I love that, I think that's exactly right. And that we can benefit from a knowledge of history. I'll give you an example. When the 08 meltdown happened, uh, a lot of my friends, even in the financial sector, would say, oh, this is a depression. I'd say, no, it's not. In the depression, in many American cities, the animals in the zoo were shot and the meat distributed to the poor. When that happens, I'll agree we're in a depression. And that didn't happen. And it's not going to happen this time. And so that gives you, it, 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 history can be a kind of armor that can protect you and give you at least perspective to sort of understand what we think is the most complicated time. We actually don't live in as complicated times as, as others. It's not the Depression. It's not the Second World War. It's not the Civil War. Those were really complicated times, and well, people dealt with them. We need to be reminded of that, though. I don't think that all people the people necessarily... They don't get it. We, yeah. we're, we're all narcissistic. We all sort of believe that right now is the most important time, and of course, in a way it is, it's the only time. But we can learn, because human nature never changes, from the past. We can understand leadership by studying the lives of the so far men who have become presidents of the United States. You can understand what it takes to be a good leader. You can see among those uh, presidents, which are the most successful. It's, it's, it's very interesting. And, it, you know, we like to talk about what the elements of, of leadership are. I found it most interesting that the thing that again and again and again distinguished the better presidents was empathy. That ability to feel what another person goes through. Not demonize somebody that disagrees you with you, but can say, you know what, I've just been elected president, I'm president of all Americans. And a, a kind of a deep appreciation for the Constitution and understanding it's a flexible, nuanced document that is our blueprint for survival. So you have all of the things. Uh, it can't all be about you, it's gotta be about the other person, and you've got to actually have a working knowledge of how government works and, and what the Constitution is about. And, and the ones that have been most successful, the folks we put up on Mount Rushmore, the ones we list as the best presidents, all have that in common. It has nothing to do with party. It's not a red state, blue state issue. It's a human issue. Mm -hmm. And that there's some people that are more temperamentally suited to it and others who clearly are not. So let me ask this question then, because I think you're right. I think empathy is like such an important part of it, a human, el a human element. Um, you have somebody like Abraham Lincoln. In today's era, though, of television and media and, and whatever, social media, the whole thing, could an Abraham Lincoln, with a man of his empathy, ever have been elected? Well, and I think the empathy would have helped him. How do we reward but, empathy but is what I'm saying today. Well, you know, we don't right now. We don't re reward it in that regard, which is, I think, to our detriment. We don't necessarily promote people who have that. We are in a kind of if it bleeds, it leads environment in which the louder you are, the most outrageous you are, the, the more attention you get. And then that is supposed to translate into leadership. It, it's a disconnect. It doesn't happen. And I think as you look back and think about the greatest presidents, you know, I think George Washington could have get elected any time. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, you know, there's some scandals behind him and maybe that would be discovered by a media that was not discreet and, and it would be blabbered all over. Abraham Lincoln was fairly depressive. Uh, Walt Will Whitman called him so awful ugly that he was beautiful, uh, but maybe he wouldn't be telegenic enough. Uh, he gave too short a speech at Gettysburg. Not even C-SPAN would have had time to catch that, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he can't even walk. How could he possibly help us through the Depression or the Second World War? I'm afraid that our nature, our, our, our sort of the way we select for heroes has been really narrowed to a kind of bizarre expectation of perfection, a disappointment when we don't see that perfection, but a toleration of bad behavior. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're really in a place where we live in a reality television universe. Right. But reality television isn't reality. I mean, you don't propose to somebody that you love in front of millions of people. You don't eat bugs in front of millions of people. That's not reality television. The kind of history that we do, we hope, can remind you that those people who live before us, though of different dress, of perhaps powdered wigs, actually were very much like us and it's only the arrogant 
arrogance of the presence that thinks that somehow because we're here, we know more than them. Human nature never changes. Yeah. People had discussions in the 1850s as deep and as, um, as sort of rich and as complicated as one we might be having today. I would love to be there for that. Yeah, me too. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I, you've been a masterful in terms of your use of multiple mediums, right? I mean, you have television, you have books, you've always mixed that together. Um, you've started bringing books into your television series early. You understood that there needed to be a companion volume or that there was more to tell. You're, you're holding in your hand the greatest uh, machine human beings have ever built. The greatest mechanism is the book. And I'm in a television medium, I'm in a visual meeting, but I still think it goes back, in the beginning is the word. Our films are heavily narrated, they're dense, they're rich in words, we don't believe that they're an enemy. I think a lot of filmmaking, a lot of television sets up a kind of opposition. And I think one of the reasons why we worry for our republic that we don't share the common canon that we believe we should share is because our media culture actually either actively or subtly and indirectly discourages encourages the word. We're now, you know, we're now into caricatures and emojis. We're not into, into things. I mean, I, I wanted to register a domain name called blah, blah, blah dot com. Somebody else ever had it. But it was going to be, it wouldn't let you send unless you had 1,400 characters. Really? Which is like a letter and a half, <laughs> which would force, I mean, there would be six people using it, but it would at least force people into this idea that, that the word actually means something. And now when it's all text or abbreviated emails, what do we know? Right. We still have these things. Yes, we do. They're, they're really great. And, and as much as we're distracted by the, all the stuff we see and kittens and balls of yarn on YouTube, we also yearn for meaning. And all meaning comes in duration. And we're, we're all, we also yearn simultaneously for curation. There's so much stuff out there that when my Civil War series came out and then baseball and jazz and World War II and, and national parks, the critics will say, this is great, but nobody will watch it. They didn't say that about the Roosevelt's, our most recent big long series, because they know people are, will binge watch anything. And they were mistaken earlier. There is a whole bunch of people who likes to watch videos of kittens and balls of yarn, but they also know that they need to devote a significant amount of time to really inculcate yourself with something. And that's why long form television and books will always be around. We will need that meaning. We will need to just shut off the tsunami of impressions we get from TV, from radio, from the internet, from all our devices, and just spend time with one thing for a significant amount of time and, yeah. and why we're always drawn to books. I'm stealing every bit of that for our next promotional bit on Book View Now. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. And I will say that it is a pleasure to have you. We feel at PBS that you are uh, one of ours. and it It's, is you know, look, it's the other way around. I am so honored to be part of this family. I've been only one place in my professional life, and that's public television. Every film that I've finished and signed my name to has gone on to public television. I like the initials, right? particularly the first and the last initial. It's public, that means it's for us. When it's not the marketplace, we don't have to be the lowest common denominator. We can actually aim high because most Americans do. And we manage, though underfunded, to produce the best science, the best nature, the best children's, the best public affairs, the best drama, the best music, all of this sort of stuff, and the best history, I'm told, you know, Ki you know, kind of often under siege. And, you know, the last initial is not, it's not public broadcasting system. It's public broadcasting service. Yep. That's what it ought to be about. And we've lost a lot of altruism. We've lost a lot of the sense of our responsibility to each other. American history, I know, is always an interesting tension between personal freedom, what I want, and collective freedom, what we need. Unfortunately, in recent years, the former is winning. And that leads towards narcissism and death. But the collective thing, these shared sacrifices that we've made at the times of greatest stress, which you can find in that, and the, and the leaders that got us through those difficult times is where we ought to be at. Yeah. And um, I, I'm happy uh, to be able to uh, participate in a network that would you know, make a little bit of room for me and say, 
what, what are you interested in? What are you doing? What are you thinking? Sure, is it going to be 10 episodes, 18 hours, as our upcoming series on the Vietnam War is, you know? Uh, eight parts, 16 hours on the history of country music that's coming up on, you know, two parts, four hours on uh, Ernest Hemingway. I, they've been able to say, yeah, we're, we're interested in what you think it should be. And not like nobody's going to watch uh, 12 hours of still photographs, which is what everyone said at the Civil War. Yeah. PBS didn't. They said, we'll put it on. We'll bring it on, and amen to that. And in the meantime, uh, thanks for, for distilling this down in a way that I think all of our kids are going to love and enjoy. And I look forward to the next one here. The book is Grover Cleveland Again, A Treasury of American Presidents. We're with Ken Burns at the National Book Festival here in Washington, D.C. There's more to come. Thank you very thanks much. Thanks so much. Good to see you.